to read the box on this? What up? Testing one, two. Can you give me a wave if you can hear me in the back row? A little higher. Testing one, two. Yeah, that's way better. Thank you. See, it was already worth it having you in here. I'm so appreciative. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Southland Falls Board of Education Meet the Candidates Night. Uh, my name is Christy Knorr, Superintendent of Schools, and Kevin Petrell, Assistant Superintendent of Business. are going to spend the first about 15 minutes of the programming reviewing the budget, uh, which all of you as voters will be uh, acting on on May 16th, along with picking three of these candidates out of the five tonight. Um, so. Uh, this budget um, is a great one for so many of you to see this year uh, because New York State was able to right side some of our foundation aid that has been missing from our district since about 2010 and we're able to give that back to resources for our students. So this is just our budget calendar. We're here on the second to last line. The two people in the room that are happiest that we're at the end of this are Kevin and I. So my smile is bright because I know there's only one day left to go of this calendar, uh, but this is an important one. Uh, this, oh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. Um, I do like numbers as an old math, math teacher, but um, I'll let Kevin do the uh, heavy lifting of how he got to the budget we did. Okay, um, I'm not gonna wear you out with the formula. Uh, this is the 2% tax cap that you've always heard about. It really is a misnomer. It's a, this is actually a simplified version of the formula. Um, but where we're at, uh, sure. Uh, so where we're at as a tax cap is three and a half percent. And I work with the board and just for your own information, estimating for about the next five years, we should be about the same, the same three and a half percent. Uh, we're not going to have big swings uh, as a district. We're in pretty good shape fiscally. Um, this is a summary of the budget itself. Uh, the yellow highlighted, it's a $69 million, almost $70 million budget. It is a big increase over last year, 7.6%. Um, revenue is, you can see, is going up nearly $4 million. A lot of that is state aid, that's the foundation aid that Christine just mentioned. Uh, almost $3 million of that is just the foundation aid. Um, the uh, tax levy is going up 2.8%. As I mentioned, the tax cap is 3.5%. Uh, that's where we have to keep it without a super majority. And we asked the school board their goals about a month ago. They recommended 2.9% and we're actually coming in at 2.8%. So we're a little bit under what the school board recommended. What are we getting for that? I'm gonna let Christine talk about that. I get the good part, yes. sorry. Um, so one of the things, um, not necessarily in our actual foundation aid budget, but that was increased in our overall budget, is the amount of money we get for UPK. Um, and so uh, we have been very lucky for a number of years to partner with Day Nursery and have 108 students for a half day program. Uh, the state has been um, doing three year old and four year old full day programs in all the big city schools. So about 68% of the current four year old population in New York State already does a full day UPK program. And that, that now they are pushing and hoping for more schools to catch on to this. Uh, because of the increase that we received in this, we will now have six full day UPK classrooms. That's 108 spaces in uh, all four buildings. Uh, we still have to maintain three classrooms at Moreau um, because of the space, but there will be one classroom at Ballard one at Harrison, and one at Tanglewood. And that is our hope, is to continue with 108 um, or more in the future. This is what staff we need for this, and we are in full-on uh, recruitment mode uh, for these positions. One of the other things that was really important to us is as we think about 
the taxpayers and the burden that we tend to put on families and especially became true in light of coming back uh, from being um, off-site and doing remote learning was how many of the extra things we ask of our community members and our parents. Uh, one of the things that has really just increased exponentially, especially in cost, is the cost of supplies. So normally, you get your list, you get, we tend to try to make it a little generic for pre-K to five, and you have to go out and fight the crowds at a store in hopes that the Ticonderoga pencils and the glue sticks are there, make sure they're sharpened, Parent teachers like them sharpened, and we need to find all the supplies, and when they don't have the right color folder, folder um, the kids start crying and you lose your mind. Or maybe that was just my experience as a parent, um, but I definitely lived it uh, for that. So uh, we are trying to take that burden from pre-K to fifth grade off of our families. And so for next year, uh, we will be giving you all supplies um, except for headphones. We do because of the sanitary piece of that. We're asking families to do headphones uh, for that. So all supplies will be given to all UPK to five year, uh, to fifth grade students. So that burden is taken off of our community members. Uh, staffing, this is where we are for total staffing for next year at 540. And this is the summary of changes. And if you visit our website, it is new. Uh, we did an updated version, so please bear with us as you start to sift through our website. I know everyone knew exactly where to click, and now you're probably looking a little bit. I still have to do that as well, uh, but we're trying to give an updated version of this. One of the important things for us um, that the board approves every year is our themes and goals, and we've had three consistent themes for a while now, and that is safety, uh, student well-being, and mental health and then future ready learning. And so when we create a budget to um, show our Board of Education, we wanna make sure it falls in one of these buckets of all the things that our administrators are really hoping that we add. So in terms of safety, um, we're adding an additional aid in both the middle school and high school uh, to help with hallways, to help with cafeteria, anything that's been going on in those buildings. Uh, the high school is going to have a .5 teacher on assignment as a restorative coordinator and as a peer mediator. Uh, the school district has been working with Mediation Matters and has had a really good relationship with them and they've been really training some of our people to really help with these sessions. And we're going to hire a full-time nurse at the high school to allow for more time for our district head nurse to be at all buildings because of that, you know, that health safety is just as important as our physical safety, etc. When we look at student <coughs> well-being, um, one of the things that we have slowly added on is really special programs uh, for well-being of our students at the elementary level. Uh, when I got here 11, 11 years ago, uh, it was very clear, one of the first things I had heard is we don't have enough support of our youngest students. At that time, we had two uh, psychologists split between four buildings, and psychologists' really main focus is our students with special needs. And so our principals were advocates for the elementary program for a number of years. So we added in social workers first. We now have a social worker in every elementary school. This year, uh, we started with ESSER funds and we're able to roll them over into our regular budget. We have two guidance counselors going between uh, two buildings each. And based on the data uh, that our director of, uh, of school counseling and social emotional learning put together for us, um, that data shows that we really need more support to be proactive in those areas uh, for our, our, small, our youngest students. So we will next year, if the budget passes, have one school counselor in all of the elementary buildings to help with those tier one strategies on student well-being. And then future ready, oh, listen, Mr. Fitzgerald, I have a lot to say on that slide, I'm sorry. Um, and then the future ready and, and learning loss is not my word, it's a state word. I hate some I hate that word. You can't lose something that students don't know about, so that's an adult, that's an adult issue, and we talk about it in terms of kids. But anyway, I have to put it in because that's what we have to address. Uh, we are adding four AIS math teachers, one in every building. Uh, Tanglewood having uh, a larger population than our other three are uh, will be um, then um, adding an AIS ELA teacher based on the data that that building has. Again, I said two elementary counselors. And then four full-time elementary substitutes. We're hoping this assists with some of the confusion of just not having enough subs around the area. By having our own, we hope to be able to fill spaces to keep all of our special area teachers in their classes full-time. I'll turn it back over to Kevin, because I see numbers. Uh, this is just... Um 
a breakdown of what we have uh, for the total budget. And I just want to highlight a few things for you. Uh, the first is the biggest increase is in instruction. I mean, that's really where you want the increase to be. Uh, that's really coming from hiring six UPK teachers, six aides, um, the specialists that Christine had talked about. A lot of that is coming from the salaries. Another thing I want to highlight is healthcare benefits. Um, all year long, um, I knew that healthcare was going to get ugly this year, and it did. Uh, it's a 12% increase for us. Uh, this is really beyond our control. We can blame COVID, the fact that so many medical procedures were put off. Uh, they all came back last year, and you know we're making up for it. And really, we have no control. We just have to have to do it. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is you'll see that the debt service for buses, um, what we're doing is in June, we are paying off the last of the loans for our buses. So uh, this year, when we're, instead of borrowing money to buy buses, uh, the buses is part of the budget. And so if you're voting yes on the budget, you're voting yes on buying buses. Um, so that's why transportation is going up because the numbers instead of going from loans are just going to there. With interest rates going up, um, it really made more economic sense if, that we can pay for it in cash rather than borrowing money for buses. Good news. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is at the bottom is the Interfund Transfer. Uh, there was a bond uh, that's coming off. It's 15 years old. It's $177,000. Um, so we're making less payments um, starting next year. That's all that that is. Um, the other thing that you'll see on the, where the revenue is coming from is the building aid is also negative $177,000. Uh, that's where we try and keep things in balance that the building aid matches the bonds. So when one goes off, the other goes off and you don't really have dips. Um, so that's, that's really good news. Uh, you'll see that for us, the foundation aid is a big increase, about $3 million. Um, and that's why we're able to afford a lot of the programs that we're doing and really we envision that the foundation aid will continue this will be the new normal this is our new formula so all of these increases that you're talking we're talking about is sustainable over the next number of years so what does that mean for the taxpayers so normally they break it down for a hundred thousand dollar home i don't know of many homes in south Glens falls that sell for a hundred thousand dollars so what we're doing is saying $200,000 is a more realistic number. Um, what that means is a $56 increase in taxes approximately. Um, how is that broken down by the towns? Um, this is beyond our control. These are the various town assessors that do that. What we're voting on is the actual budget and then the town assessors decide how much your house is worth, et cetera. Uh, for those of you who live in Moreau, no, you just got a new assessment uh, the other day. It wasn't me, it was the town assessor. Um, and Moreau is at 100% equalization. What does that mean? It means that the market price of your house is the assessed value, or close enough. Again, you can argue compared to your neighbor's house and everything, but the goal is to be at 100%. Uh, you'll notice over the last number of years, Northumberland and Wilton have not been doing that and the spread has been getting worse and worse. How does that affect the town? Well, if I can get everybody's agreement that the premise is if you live in a $200,000 home in Northumberland, Wilton, or Moreau, you should pay about the same in taxes. So if we go with that premise, the first is that Moreau, a $200,000 home is assessed at $200,000. So the tax rate, and this is just my estimate at this point, is 14.376. So you multiply 200 by 14, and it comes out to 28.75 in taxes. At Northumberland, because the assessed value is so much lower than the market value, the New York State says we have to equalize it at 72%. So that $200,000 house is assessed at 144,000. The tax rate is higher, but the overall dollars that you pay will be the same. And the same thing would happen in Wilton. Um, and this right now is just my estimate. Because Moreau has increased the assessments, probably what, and assuming that Northumberland and Wilton don't do anything, 
then the tax number that I have would go down a little bit because everybody's assessment goes up, the tax rate goes down, and it's just a different way of slicing up the pie. Um, so I know it sounds confusing, but in August, I'll get the assessments and the actual numbers um, will be assessed. And again, if there was any improvements in your home, that would affect the assessment as well. <coughs> okay, uh, fund balance. Uh, as a district, we're uh, supposed to have 4%. You can see in 2021, um, we were a little over that. The school board agreed that we wanted to keep it a little high. That was the COVID year. We didn't know how much cleaning supplies, how much uh, materials we were going to need. We decided we were going to be um, a little bit over just as protection. Last year we were 4%. This past year you can see we're much higher. Um, and some of that came from the fact that quite frankly, we had trouble hiring people. Um, so uh, that's why we had money left over at the end of the year. And so there's a few things that we wanted to do. One was we took some of that money, paid off the bus debt that I mentioned before. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is the board has um, approved a repair reserve. That is money that we put off to the side for any big repairs that we're not planning on. Uh, a leaky roof, a new boiler. Uh, it's just money set aside for that. So because we have that excess money in our unrestricted fund balance, we're asking the voters to approve, taking $2 million from that fund and just putting it into a newly created repair reserve. We're also adding money to the teacher's retirement system. And again, all of these reserves have a specific purpose. And really what that purpose is, is in more difficult times, if state aid starts going down and TRS rates start going up, et cetera, we'll have money to keep things in balance. We won't have to make hard decisions like we had to do you know, 12 years ago. Um, did you want to talk about the capital budget? Yeah, um, so those are really, you know, the numbers of that. Um, but uh, this is a picture of Tanglewood going on right now. Uh, one of the other big things going on, not budget related, was uh, thank you to all who came out last year um, and approved um, our capital budget, our capital project. Um, this is the second large one um, since 2015 that we've done. Um, and the very first phase of this is to uh, put uh, it at Tanglewood our new track that will have eight lanes, our new baseball fields, um, and to update um, 10 classrooms at, inside the building. So they have been cutting. Um, that one tree in the picture also went down. Uh, for some reason, they didn't cut it down the first time. It looked a little weird, so we made sure to have that done. Uh, but uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, a gap between the houses. We did give everyone around Tanglewood an opportunity to see what that map looked like. Um, so those, those numbers are there, and this is a rough sketch of what we'll be, ha what we'll be doing there. Uh, that will be ready. Uh, not for, um, this will be ready soon because we can't use it, we can't tear down these until these are ready to use. So that summer of 2024, when we'll be starting the work on athletics here at the high school. Also in 2024, we'll be working on some of our art programs at the middle school. Um, new LGI, uh, state of the art, um, uh, different type of theater there. So more to come, and I will continually update the web page, but also update here if you want to come to meet the candidates night next year. Uh, we will also, that's a little plug, so I get people to actually hear all these things, it's so exciting. Um, we, um, we will have that there, um, give you updates there as well. So what will you be voting on on May 16th? Uh, proposition one is do you approve the budget of $69,871,000 at a 2.8% tax levy increase? Proposition two, uh, the board approved the funding repair reserve. That repair reserve we have to take to the community for their approval. Um, again, this is a reserve. It's like your savings account for that. Um, this has no tax impact. We are just able to then place money there for that. And then number not voting on buses. You're not voting on buses, correct. Normally, on Proposition 2, we vote on buses. Uh, but because that we, we'll have no debt to that, we don't have to acquire debt service for those buses for this year. And again, why we're here tonight is to discuss our three open seats. Uh, this is the order uh, that you will see them on on the ballot. And you'll be hearing from all five of these people tonight. Uh, we're really appreciative that they took the time out so we get to all get to know them a little bit better. 
Uh, the vote is Tuesday, May 16th, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, town and rural residents, you come to Tanglewood. Uh, town North Armbo and Town of Wilton, you go to Ballard. Um, and there are directions to go into the building separately than from where the students enter in both of those buildings. Uh, we have had quite a number of people reach out to us this week about how we do absentee ballots. Uh, so I am adding this to the presentations that we do online for anyone who comes to listen to those as well. Uh, the above four things are the reasons for an absence. So in the hospital, if you already have a physical disability and you're on the list, those were already sent out. Uh, your occupation or studies required to be outside of the city. So we have a lot of college students giving us a call this week um, asking how they can get their absentee ballot in. Um, on vacation for the entire duration of voting, that 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., um, or your spouse or child, parent or child of someone that also qualifies. Um, so we, to get this ballot, you fill out the application. Uh, we will uh, be, well, I said in the lobby, but I think we'll be right up here. Uh, Karen Bates, um, uh, my school secretary, who's in charge of all of that, um, will be here tonight in case anyone is in the room. Uh, that needs to be absent or you can let people know in your family uh, you can drop by our office from 8 to 4 any day to get the process started um, we can only do the ballot after uh, after um, and you can mail it in or hand it in the sealed envelope um, these do not get counted until after the polling closes um, on the night of the vote um, and that will only count once it's confirmed that you are a registered voter um, so that is really um, how you get absentee ballots uh, communication, obviously this is one of them. Get out, uh, tell your friends. Uh, Kevin and I are doing three online sessions. Um, I used to go around and try to get community members to come and it was always hard because of, of sports being changed all the time and different activities being canceled at this time of the year. Uh, so we've tried to make it convenient. We have a Zoom link. Uh, it does get sent out to parents on Parent Square. Uh, we cannot put it on our website until that morning um, or that evening. So we'll make sure Carrie kind of puts that out so that way it's there and that's just simply um, because we want to make sure um, it is um, not it's confidential as much as we can. Uh, so we'll be doing those. The first one is tomorrow morning and we have two more coming for that. You will be getting your newsletter soon which will have the bios and everything in there. Um, we go around to all the buildings. So we hope um, that you got a lot out of that. Um, I will be around after to take any questions on the budget vote um, if there's anything specific people want to talk about. Okay, so with that said, um, as this is for Really Meet the Candidates, um, uh, Bill Elder is our current president and he's also running for a seat next year. So I'd like to invite our vice president of our current board of education, uh, John Farrell, um, to introduce um, who our moderators are. Um, I'd like to thank our Board of Education uh, for attending this evening. Um, I also want to thank, before I turn over to John, uh, Lisa Hogan and Christine Dawson, who are our current board members that are no longer running for the board. Um, we have a nine-person board, and um, everyone takes an important role in what they do, and they really worked hard uh, to make policy better and to make things better for our students. Uh, they've been such thoughtful board members, really thinking about all angles for all students, and I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so thank you, Lisa, and please tell Dr. Dawson when you see her that um, I acknowledge that too. Um, and now I'll turn it over to John for the introductions. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. And thank you everyone who came out tonight. Thank you to the candidates for putting themselves out there for everybody. And a special thank you to our moderators, uh, Linda McKenney and Barb Thomas. Uh, and thank you to our timekeepers, uh, Janice Burns and Shelley to Batman. <coughs> and I'll let you get to it. Did you all get red cards? Who has the red cards? <laughs> they each get two.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Meet the Candidates event for the South Glens Falls School District. If all the candidates um, on the ballot were invited, and they're all here. The event was organized by the Glens Falls School District, South, South Glens Falls School <laughs> District. I caught that, South Glens Falls, I get that. Um, and so it's moderated by, I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County. This will be recorded. I know there's some information in your, um, here, but I'm gonna repeat some of it. Um, so it is gonna be recorded and it will be posted on the school district website. Um, our league rules require that if a Meet the Candidates event is recorded, it must be broadcast or rebroadcast in its entirety. With that in mind, we ask audience members to refrain from filming any portion of this evening's event. If we see somebody videotaping, we'll stop the event and until your phone or camera is put away. And any kind of interruptions like that just takes time away from the candidates being able to answer questions, and that's what we're really here for. So again, my name is Linda McKenney, and I'm representing the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County. I live in the town of Wilton. The League of Women Voters of Saratoga County, of all League of Women Voters, are nonpartisan volunteer political organizations who are dedicated to the informed and responsible participation of citizens in government. The League never supports or opposes any political party or candidate, and that has been our policy since 1920, when women got the vote. Membership is open to anyone who is eligible to register and vote, so consider joining your local league or our league. I'd like to thank the South Glens Falls School District for arranging this event and for you, the audience, for attending and watching. It's important, your participation is important. I realize that many of you have a strong opinions about the issues that will be discussed tonight. However, I will insist that the candidates in the audience treat each other with respect. Please refrain from cheering, applauding, making comments, or otherwise interrupting the proceedings. Any disruption reduces the time the candidates have to answer questions. And we have five candidates this evening, and also we have a lot of questions that all came from you. We want to give them a chance to answer as many questions as possible. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you any applause just at the end, after everything's all done. That's when we'll take applause. We have received questions from the public, and then we, we review them. The league reviews them for redundancy, and um, also questions of a personal nature. So we want to make sure the questions are ones that all of the candidates can answer, and a question is, is not directed at one person. Also, the candidates have been encouraged to answer all of the questions on, there's a, a website called vote411.org, which is a pretty awesome website um, for any election. You can go to that website, you put in your address and your zip code, and it will deliver to you whatever candidates are running in whatever election it might be, and you can get more information that way. So we've invited the candidates to answer questions and you can do it. So that'll be more information in addition to what you're going to get this evening. Those don't go there right away though, because we need time for them to answer and get them up there. So I'd say a week or so before the election, all that information should be there. Vote411.org. Let's see. So candidates, we uh, this is your opportunity to let voters know your stance on these all the topics and how you will address issues facing the South Glens Falls schools. Please don't, do not waste time tearing down or labeling your opponents. Deal with the facts. In your closings, do not put your opponent on the spot with no chance for a reply. Um, so we have two timers sitting up here this evening, and they're going, going to hold up signs for the candidates when um, they're progressing through whatever they're saying or answering. So a green sign means you have one minute left, a yellow means you have 30 seconds left, and a red means time is up, and you'll hear a bell. Can we hear the bell? Okay, time's up. All right. The five candidates for the three open school board seats in ballot order are Haley Brashears, Edward Potter, William Elder, Nicholas Healy, and Christopher Music. So now it's time for their opening statements. And 
they have drawn lots for their order. And so the order will be the same for opening and closing, but as we go through the questions, we rotate the order. So people get different opportunities to be first answering questions, okay? So, all right, are you all ready? Pardon me? Start your engines, rub, rub, okay. Um, so, st yeah, start your engines, get ready for your opening statements, and William, you're first. Thank you. As you all know, I'm William Elder. I'm pretty much a lifelong resident of South Winds Falls. My wife and I graduated from South Winds Falls. Our children attend to South Winds Falls, and we have a granddaughter attending Oliver with W. Winch Middle School. I've been privileged and honored to serve on the Board of Education for 20 years now, and I had a break in service in 1998. For the last 12 years, I've been the school board president. We have a total of five grandchildren, one great grandchild. Unfortunately, they don't all live in the good self and small school district. I attended col uh, college at State University of New York in Cobal Skill. I worked 27 years in healthcare, 25 at Albany Medical Center, and 12 at Bassett Healthcare, and I retired in 2010 as director of the technology. As being a part of the board, I've had the opportunity to serve our community and our board on uh, different panels for, something, for the Saratoga County School Board Association and around that school board association. <laughs> I've got one minute to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm currently on the uh, awards committee for New York State School Boards Association for the uh, Champions of Change and the Dire Effort Award for a uh, leading school board member in the state. I've also presented uh, and, uh, Panels, New York State School Board Association for President's Academy, and attended several sessions where we've had, we, where I represented our school district meeting with Lee Stefanik, as well as her officers, and also with the State Education Commissioners. And thank you. I just <laughs> Okay, Nicholas. Good evening. I'd really like to, to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I think is a really important part of what we do in education is allowing the community to, to meet the Board of Education candidates. I'd like to thank everybody that supported my candidacy. Um, we've got a really good um, response you know, online to, to things that I'm thinking and things that I'd like to okay. support for the school and for the community. Um, so thank you to everyone, especially my wife. I don't have a personal agenda for running for the school board. I do not. I do not have a, an axe to grind in any way, shape, or form. My desire for running for the school board is to be helpful to the students, the community. My son and daughter have had an amazing experience in Southwinds Falls. I know not everyone has had that same experience, but by being on the board, I'm hoping that we can give that experience to, to all students. I won't have all the answers. I, I won't have them all tonight, for sure. Um, but I'll do my best to work with my fellow board members to make sure that we do the best that we can for the I believe the Southlands Falls can be the gold standard of education in our area. I, I firmly believe that with my heart. Uh, I don't mean to be critical of anyone tonight. Uh, there's a lot of things in the school districts that none of us in the community really understand are going on from day to day. Uh, Mr. Control, I will advocate for things that cost money. I think there are a lot of things that we need to do in our community to make sure that we are doing what's best for our kids, increasing some of our opportunities making sure that we, we come up with programming that maybe other school districts aren't thinking about to make sure that all of our kids graduate and they have the opportunities once they leave this school that they want to and that they don't feel like they've missed out on the chance to be successful <coughs> later on in life. 30 seconds break. <laughs> People are leaving education in droves. It's sad, but it's true. I think the Board of Education's job is to make sure that we listen to all the stakeholders in the community, that we listen to our students, that we listen to the, the, the teachers and the faculty and staff, um, and that we listen to our administrators. It's not an easy job. It's not an easy job for anybody. We all face challenges. Even our administration you know, has things that they have to do that I'm sure that they would rather not. Um, so I, I just ask for our, the community to be supported um, and to really stand up and make sure that our kids get what they deserve. Okay, and you call, yeah, I see you moved your mic closer. Um, so make sure you, you're talking when you speak, all of you are speaking into your mic so we can, everyone can hear you. Christopher. Good evening. 
My name is Chris Music. I am a parent of two children in the district. They're in uh, kindergarten and first grade. Um, I, besides being a father, I'm also a husband to a wonderful woman. Um, I am a small business owner. A few small businesses that I own and operate and manage. Um, I have uh, a great deal of um, support uh, from, from friends and family, and that's, that's one thing that I've uh, come to, to realize. Um, sorry, I've lost my spot. Um, I'm also a, uh, a U.S. Marine. I'm an engineer by education, and I'm certainly a proud American. Um, I'm running for school board because I want to represent teachers, parents, students. Um, I feel like um, there's there's parents and students and teachers out there that that see problems, but they don't necessarily believe they have a voice, and I want to be that voice for them. Um, I, I'm looking for a challenge. I have, I have absolutely no desire to sit up here for three years and, and just nod my head, yes. Um, I'm looking to challenge some of the things that we've just kind of went along with over the years. Um, I want parents to trust the system that they send their impressionable, impressionable children to. I want children, I want teachers to feel like they're making a difference again. And I want children to be prepared for the real world um, and not, not the, the make-believe one that we seem to be living in. Thanks. Okay. Edward? Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Edward Potter. Uh, I'm thankful to uh, be given this opportunity to discuss why I, am, why I want to uh, represent uh, you as a member of the school board. As a lifelong resident, I am passionate about my community and I'm also especially passionate about the children in our community. I believe there is a there is no uh, greater influence on the culture of our community than our school district. I will uh, serve by the uh, listening with uh, uh, in, uh, excuse me by listening with an open mind, be uh, fiscally uh, responsible, and respect. Uh, you with pride uh, of the school district. Um, also, uh, I've been affiliated with youth for over 40 years in our community, uh, being uh, on boards of the Youth Advisory Board in Saratoga County, uh, the Buns Falls YMCA. Um, I served as recreation director for five years. I served on the recreation commission for five years, and uh, I want the best for our school district and especially our children. Thank you. Mihaly. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Haley Brashears, and I am excited to be running for the Board of Education. I have lived in this community for over 14 years. My domestic partner, Brett Bullish, is um, the GED teacher at South High. We have two young children, one who is currently in the district, and next year both of them will be at Ballard. As a mother of two children in it, who will attend schools in this district, education is certainly a priority of mine. As a partner to a teacher and a daughter of a teacher's aide, I am well versed in the current issues that our educators face today. As a homeowner, I want to make sure that tax dollars are used responsibly and invested in care and consideration. Um, I moved to this area from California where I was born and raised, and this may sound crazy, but I love this community so much more than any place I have ever lived. Um, the passion this district has to give back to the community is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It is unmatched. I have volunteered in a number of capacities locally, and, which has also given me a first hand uh, of what people can do here. Uh, my partner and I have strong ties to this area and we don't plan on leaving anytime soon, so I'm very invested in this district. As far as my educational background goes, I graduated from the University of California at Santa Barbara, where I obtained bachelor's degrees in mathematics and psychology. I've been in banking for 16 years, 14 of those with TD, 
and my background in finance would make me a valuable asset to this board. Uh, my motivation on this board boils down to the des uh, desire to help the next generations and to create a safe space for every type of learner. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Now it's time for the questions. Candidates will have up to a minute and a half to respond to a question. You are not required to respond. You may pass if you don't want to answer the question. Um, each candidate will be afforded two opportunities with your red cards to request an additional one and one half minutes during the question session for a rebuttal or to expand an answer. Please hold up your red card and wait to be acknowledged by me before you begin your extra time. And if I'm not looking at you, just yell at me. Um, that may only be done during the question session. It may not be used for closing statements. So the questions are going to be directed to the candidates in rotation so that everyone gets a chance to respond first. And William, you will go first. And the first question is, and if anybody wants me to repeat the question, when it's your turn, I'm happy to do that. What do you see as the most pressing district challenge for the 23-24 school year? As uh, our superintendent alluded to the themes that we have in the district, security, mental health, future revenue learning, I'm very concerned about the programs we put in place to support our students across our grade levels. I, I worry about the social emotional learning as we come out of this pandemic, a lot of people depend on that. And I feel so we've got programs in place to address that. One of the things that I feel that we're going to be challenged about going forward, and I'm a little bit nervous about, is we're getting involved in planning for electric vehicles, having no idea what the cost is going to be to the district, the community, and what the state's going to do for us. But we're going to be getting those planning phases. I'm very encouraged and excited, as Christine had indicated, we're going to full day, full day pre-K in our all four elementary buildings we've had it from rural school for a number of years uh, pressing wise is to uh, we as a board to continue to su support our administration and particularly programs that we need to in enhance and to improve the underlying feeling being we as a board to continue to say we're not going to put a program in place unless we can sustain it thank you okay thank you nicholas Thank you. Coming back from COVID has, has been a challenge for all school districts. I think one of the things that, that we all struggled with has definitely been having, you know, I think an increase in, in some of the, the behaviors uh, in our school districts. And again, I, I don't blame anyone for that. I think we are just in a, a difficult time. But I think it's something that we, we all have to come together to address. You know, obviously, administration, the school board, obviously our faculty and staff and, and certainly our, our students too who do have some ownership you know in that process um, but really making sure that, that our school district is the place that everyone feels comfortable coming to every day that students aren't losing out on their learning because of the behavior of other people taking away from what they're able to do each day and also making sure that we are, are really keeping track of, of student attendance because if the kids aren't here they can't learn and, and working with families you know, respectively to try to, to make sure that our kids are here learning every day and taking advantage of the quality education that I think that they can get here in South Lawrence Fall. None of these things have, have easy answers. It takes everybody coming together. It takes the school board listening to, to our administrators, to our, our faculty and staff, and, the, and to our students, certainly the community as well. But I think that those are things we need to get under wraps. We have to take care of those foundation issues before we can really start to build a school district where we're able to do a lot of extra things for some of our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher? Thanks. Um, so challenges, I I guess to, to put it, um, I wouldn't, I guess I can't really narrow it down to just the school year. Uh, I just see a trend. I see a trend in um, uh, accountability. I see a trend in responsibility. I see a trend in lowering, lowering of standards. Um, I, lo I like, um, there's a trend of, of mental health. There's a, there's there's all kinds of trends that I see. Um, I guess going not not the not the direction that I care to see them going. So uh, I'm really here to kind of look at a whole. I want I want to look at the entire 
the, the entirety of the system. Uh, there's a lot that I have to learn about how the system works, the ins and outs, but from what I observe as a business owner, as a parent, as a citizen, I just don't like the trends that I see. So I, you know, I guess I could get more specific, but I don't think I have time. Um, just to, to use up my time, I guess, um, uh, I'm also concerned about the budgeting, uh, and again, without without knowing the intricate details, I'll, that I'll I'm sure that I surely get um, digging into why why are the, why are the um, uh, some of the budget items that I saw today. I I can't tell. I'm certain certain that you can't tell what those actually include. So I'm looking for a little more detail. Okay, thank you, Edward. Uh, being part of the uh, COVID team or the uh, purchasing the PPE, PPE uh, products and stuff for the school district, uh, I noticed a lot of uh, concerns that um, I see with the uh, education systems where the kids lost a lot of um, time in the education system with, uh, with the Zoom. Uh, my concerns were the kids um, that were on the Zoom, if they all were on the Zoom or not on the Zoom, uh, so it put, it put us behind the eight ball with the education system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to see if we can get uh, everybody back up to speed. Uh, that means um, everybody in the school district helping out each other. We work together as a team, uh, as a board, administrators, teachers, um, and help the kids get back to where they should be at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Haley. I think that one of the uh, biggest challenges the district faces this year is um, balancing school security with uh, safe, a safe learning environment. Schools practice lockdown drills and are reminded of this potential danger um, every day and we should balance that with investing in school counselors and mental health professionals. Um, we need to train our teachers and school leaders on social emotional learning. Um, this also goes hand in hand with another challenge our school faces, which is bullying, which is not new, but um, it's gotten a lot easier with social media. So I think we need to have consistent consequences and, and, and what that looks like, I, I'm really not sure, but I would want feedback from parents and teachers in the community um, for making decisions like that. Thank you. Okay, question number two, Nicholas, you'll be first on this one. Do you believe having a healthy board comes with differing opinions? And how will you make decisions with someone you disagree with? I think the power of having a nine person board is that you know we all do have a chance to, to communicate and, and let uh, each other know how we, we think, how we feel. You know, I would hope that we all have a chance to speak, to let you know the other members of the board uh, know how we feel. But everybody should have an opportunity to, to communicate and say their piece. You know, maybe it's time. Maybe we all have a certain amount of time at each board meeting, um, but certainly maybe through some some email communications um, or the such. Uh, but what I would really like to well, sorry, um, to, to go back, um, I I think it's good to have different viewpoints and opinions. I think that really helps us to get to the best solutions a lot of the times. I may not have, have thought about uh, an issue um, fully. I may not understand why a certain thing can't happen, but you know, after somebody has a chance to, to let you know, hey, hey this is going to be a real problem if, if we move in this direction, you know, at least we all have a chance to, to educate ourselves and to have a firm grip, grip on, on what our decisions are you know, prior to, to maybe making a final decision. So I, I think you know, healthy conversation is important on the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher? Absolutely. Um, differing opinions are, are extremely important. Um, that's that's how we, that's kind of how we grow as people, as, as communities, as organizations. Um, if, if we're not allowing other people to speak and have an opinion, then we're, we're not growing. You know, it's just it's kind of plain and simple. And by being able to pull from the experience of uh, not only the people on the board, but also the community, the teachers, parents, students, um, we're, as a board, you're able to formulate a better 
uh, kind of philosophy or opinion or decisions that will affect those people. So, you know, um, my life experiences um, are probably much different than Ed. Uh, so, you know, having that diversity of pers perspective and experience and thought all gets rolled into um, the decisions that the board makes. So, if we're, if we're not if we're not having diversity and, and different opinions up here, I think something would be wrong. Okay, thank you, Edward. Uh, I think we should all be able to uh, agree to disagree. Uh, we all have different opinions. Uh, with each one of our opinions, we should be able to, to uh, get uh, the feelings of everybody so we can come to a mutual agreement uh, for the best interest of uh, the school district, the teachers, the students, um, so that uh, uh, we all always work together as a team to make everything work for the, for the children. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Haley, will you move your mic a little closer? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that it is <coughs> imperative for us to have different opinions. This board is made up of nine members for a reason. Um, we all come from different backgrounds, and you can learn from someone with a different opinion. I think what's most important, however, is that even if you have a different opinion, you're willing to, to listen and to take in what others are saying before making a decision um, and not just trying to push your agenda. Thank, Thank you. you. And William. As you know, I've had the opportunity to be on the school board and one of the things I take a lot of pride in, I guess, as a school board member, and particularly our, our board, we are diverse in terms of our educational backgrounds and whatnot, but everyone I feel very confident in sits on that board their opinions are valued, they have the opportunity to share their opinions, and there's no looking down someone's nose at one another or whatnot, they're all welcome. And I think that makes for a very good functioning board. We also require and expect from our administration proper information that we need to help make decisions. We won't always agree, but what we try to do and do do is work in the best interest of our students, our faculty and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, question three. Christopher, you're going to be first on this one. <coughs> what goals for the district would ensure that educational needs, student safety, and security are being met? And how should meeting those goals be assessed? Uh, education, safety, and what was the other term? Education, student safety, and security. Yeah, we, we live in a time, and you know, it goes back to mental health, I suppose, where uh, we're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, safety and security are, are paramount. Uh, <coughs> I, don't, I don't agree with um, the current policy. Um, I, I don't believe for a moment that a single police officer at the door um, is sufficient enough to protect the school system. I think there should be other, uh, to protect the students, I think there should be other things in place. Um, education, there's, there's a, I guess the goal for education is to, to make our kids as, as prepared as possible to face the real world. And when we're, when we're not allowing them to experience the real world and we're protecting them, um, kind of seems like we're creating this little bubble around them, they're not gonna be prepared for the real world. Um, and that's one of the big things that, are the, and the reasons that I'm running. Uh, to protect education, we have to give the teachers back the authority in the classroom uh, to enforce policy and to teach their children the way that they were taught to teach kids. Like they have a, a teaching background, but it seems like every year their hands are tied more and more. So we need to protect teachers, we need to support teachers in order to protect the education that they're receiving or giving. Thank you. Edward? Uh, at the education end, I think that uh, our goal should be to uh, teach uh, respect, responsibility, leadership, sportsmanship, character, and discipline and attitude to our students so that they understand uh, what they're going to be uh, going through in life. Uh, with teaching these uh, goals, um, it'd make them uh, better people, better students, and prepare them for uh, 
the, uh, the real world, so to speak. Uh, the safety and security of, of the school uh, is very important. So if we put the safety and security uh, at a higher standard than we have right now, uh, because I have to serve on the uh, safety, and uh, safety and security committee with the high school for uh, 15 years, um, we can get them so that they're, they're stable in the education system, so that they uh, feel comfortable, safe, and secure, so that they can learn in the proper manner. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. What goals for the district would ensure that educational needs, student safety, and security are being met, and how should meeting those goals be assessed? Well, yeah, again, school safety um, is one of my, my top priorities here. Um, I really, I, I just think that uh, what we are doing with the budget this year is great, investing, giving our elementary schools additional counselors. Again, it all goes back to mental health and having the support in place for our kids to come to school and to feel like they are safe and they have a safe place to go and that where they can be themselves. Um, I think that's a big part of, of them learning how to prepare for the real world is learning who they are and a lot of that is done at school and if they don't have a safe place to do that at school, it's gonna be difficult for them to do that. Um, as far as education, I, I think that we need to continue supporting our teachers, investing in, in them and their classrooms, which it looks like we are doing with the budget this year. So I would continue um, supporting that. Thank you. Okay, uh, William. In terms of security, a couple of things. One, I'm very pleased and happy with our security officer the different tests he does for the district throughout the district but I need to speak louder sorry and the other thing that I feel good about is in South Lens Falls middle school we have the access to South Lens Falls Village Police access to New York State State Troopers as well as Saratoga County Police we've uh, throughout building projects have secured more entrance way have secured entrances done uh, more lockdowns etc education wise <laughs> sorry <laughs> Uh, we are pretty much following and do follow state education requirements. We have put in programs throughout the years to support our children, in particular <coughs> mental health needs that's been alluded to with our uh, social emotional learning, our wellness days to help our students. And we all have to remember the pressures I believe that are being put on school districts nowadays uh, that have been greater than the last 10 years or more. And we're asked to be doing more and more and more and we're trying to do our best to meet those needs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nicholas, sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't say your name. That's sorry. okay. That's all right. I just want to make sure I'm ready to go. Uh, I do uh, agree with you know many of the candidates you know before you tonight. I, I do think that school security has to be you know our, our priority. Families, students have to, to feel comfortable that their kids are going to get home safe every day. You know, not does that only include making sure that our buildings are secure, but also um, that our students are, are safe when they are here, that they're not being subject to, to bullying or harassment um, or treated unkindly for, for any reason because of their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or anything like that. Everyone needs to be respected each and every day. In terms of education, um, you know, that's obviously why we're all here. I, part of my, my goal is part of the platform of why I'm running is to make sure that every student that leaves South Lens Falls has been you know, given the support to be successful in whatever goal that they have afterwards. You know, I think a lot of kids, even in the school district that I come from, you know, have a chance to, to get a lot of help with college, with college planning. And I think you know, that's just kind of normally what we, we focus on, unfortunately. But I do think that school districts, and again, going back to that gold standard comment, I think South Lens Falls could, you know, start up some programs, maybe some internship type programs. I, I honestly would like to see us have a, a school to work counselor to help kids who want to go into the workforce to
to maybe have some connections with the community so that they're not looking to, to maybe work just at McDonald's or Burger King or, or, or Panaford, but maybe at, at Essity or maybe at, at Finch Pride, somewhere where they are going to get a good paying job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, question number four. And Edward, you are, yes, you are first for this one. Who should select books for the school library, and under what circumstances, if any, should a book be removed from the school library? I think the, uh, the teachers, the English teachers, should be involved with uh, selecting books along with the librarian. Um, and also, they should be uh, as a team decide whether um, a book should be removed or not removed um, based on their ability as a teacher that understands what they've got to do in the English class um, and the library themselves. Uh, so I would uh, let them make the decisions themselves uh, for, for that uh, need. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ellie? Um, I think, yeah, the, the librarian and teacher should have a say in what books are selected for our library. Um, if there is a concern about a book, uh, if someone in the community or a, a parent has a concern, I think that should be brought up and discussed with administration, and then that decision can be made from there. Um, but I think that we should entrust our teachers and librarian to do the jobs they were hired to do and select the material for our students. Thank you. William? In, in terms of uh, book selection, we need to leave it up to our professionals. But I'm always concerned about worrying to make sure that whatever books we're selecting, they're age appropriate, regardless of elementary, middle school, or high school. And if a book is question or has questions about it that it should be brought to local administration and eventually to our assistant superintendent for instruction if that be the case but i believe in leaving it up to our professionals thank you nicholas thank you uh, I, I certainly support support uh, educators making decisions about what um, materials our students have access to faculty staff certainly librarians um, to make sure that you know the, the the documents that we do have in the school are meaningful um, you know i certainly wouldn't be in, in favor of, of anything that was hateful or, or bigoted um, I, I would support something that maybe covered a period of time where, where there were things that were going on that were hateful or bigoted um, as, as a way to uh, to educate people so that they know that you know unfortunately we, we don't have uh, a great social past, you know, around the world, but, but even here in the United States. Um, so I would say if, if that came to a point, I would certainly you know, ask the parents to, to contact administration. Um, I agree with Mr. Elder that it should go to these uh, assistant superintendent, and then if there's still concerns, uh, potentially come to the Board of Education for us to make a, a decision, as we are here to, uh, to obviously support the community um, and, and to make sure that, that all opinions are heard. And certainly, if, if at that point um, we deem that something you know is appropriate, um, that it is able to, to stay in the library uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Christopher. Thank you. Um, so I propose a uh, kind of a collective uh, committee, if you will, between teachers, librarians, parents. Um, I, I'm not sure how many new books are coming into the school on a on a, on a a certain frequency but if we run those through a book committee for instance um, and it doesn't have to be like a meet up and talk or talk about the book committee but uh, just allow everybody to get uh, some hands-on time with that book you might even implore uh, artificial intelligence to say does this book contain X or Y um, there should be absolutely no sexually explicit material uh, you know that's it's not age appropriate for anything um, for children. And, uh, and I'm not talking about basic biology. I'm talking about sexually explicit, like we've all heard and seen uh, on the news. Those things should be 
out of here. If that's something you want your kids to be exposed to, by all means. Thank you. All right, question number five, and Haley, you're gonna be first up for this one. What can be done to decrease bullying in schools? Give me an easy one, huh? Um, <laughs> uh, that is a very tough question, and I think um, I think a consistent um, disciplinary approach would be appropriate. I think we need to establish um, guidelines on on levels of, of bullying and what kind of action we would need to take um, and be consistent and follow through with that. Because um, without any follow through, there isn't any learning from, from that. Um, but that is something that I think should be discussed with the community, parents, teachers, and, and, and we all agree on a, on a course of action. Um, it's a very tough question, though, and it's not an easy answer. Thank you. Thank you. William? You sure. What can be done to decrease bullying in schools? Wow. <laughs> I didn't ask the question. <laughs> I think we as a district are doing our best to address that. A lot of, a lot of this things that happen in social media, outside of school hours. A lot of this takes place in social media after school hours. Things we put in place have been doing for the last couple of years, been engaging our teachers in professional development for trauma studies, learning how to address trauma, which would be bullying and whatnot. We put in restorative practice, restorative justice practices in the middle school and the high school, where we have student team leaders, that I believe it has helped cut down on some of the frustrations and the issues that we've had. However, we've had, like any other school district, particularly now, a lot of issues with kids based on the pandemic. They didn't want to come to school, getting back into that. Um, that's been an issue that we've been trying to address as best we can. Part of that in the budget, we're adding additional age and senior high school and middle school to help with monitoring students and whatnot. But, Haley said it's, it's a difficult topic, and I think we're reading it head on and doing the best we can, providing the resources. Thank you. Nicholas? Thank you. I think probably the, the most, um, the way that we'll find that the best result for, for tackling um, bullying and, and other behaviors in school is, is certainly by, by trying to have, you know, a, a, an appropriate SEL curriculum um, some of them that I've seen just aren't practical, unfortunately. I think you have to have an SEL curriculum that, that kids can respond to and can see the value in, and especially at the younger grade levels, um, to really teach kids about tolerance, you know, that, that people are all the same, you know, in their hearts, that just because we, we have differences um, doesn't mean that we should treat somebody differently or have a, you know, a, a hateful opinion of who that person is. You know, that that's just things that unfortunately um, you know, kids aren't born with. Those are things that kids are taught um, to have those opinions, um, which certainly makes me sad. Um, but you know, certainly at the, the, the senior high level, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult, you know, making sure that, that we are doing, again, SEL curriculum work there, maybe bringing in um, people to do assemblies to say, hey, these are some things that we need to do. I think some of it comes just from people not understanding what, what they're saying and how hurtful those things can, can be. So educating people to know, you know, you really shouldn't say that. You know, it's something that really hurts someone's feelings and makes them feel less and doesn't make them want to come to school. Um, thank you. Thank you. Christopher. Thanks. Um, I know this isn't, this isn't a popular statement, but I think we have to acknowledge the fact that bullying is natural to some degree. Right. Every one of us has had children or is a child to some degree. We see toddlers bickering back and forth, they fight. It's what, it's what adolescent minds do when they get together. They don't know how to handle their emotions, they don't know how to handle certain things. That is part of the learning process. Let's 
let's first acknowledge that um, by suppressing those things as kids grow older uh, if you if you try to suppress nature um, it usually it usually pops up somewhere else in a different form and, and sometimes unexpectedly right we've learned that through farming through all these different things when you try to squelch nature uh, there's always a consequence to that so uh, again depending on ages depending on the severity of the bullying I believe there should be consequences and that's another thing that uh, the school system seems to be lacking is is like fitting consequences for bullying and I know bullying has taken on many forms over the years uh, different than when I was in school but you know there, there has to be uh, equal equal punishment for uh, the acts of bullying again depending on the bullying and categorizing bullying uh, according to age and severity will all be important. Thank you. Okay. Um, Nicholas has a red card. Thank you. Um, just to, to go back about the SEO curriculum, I think it's important that we do try to, to touch base with our, our younger students before they start to develop maybe those, those negative thoughts or beliefs about other people. And I think that can make a really big difference um, so that students do become more accepting, um, you know, more tolerant, and, and instead of breaking people down, building people up, I think that's really important, and I'd like to think um, that that's what happens. But I, I know, unfortunately, you know that's not the way the world works. I know that bullying happens, um, and so I do believe that there do need to be firm consequences for students who continue to, to bully. I think there needs to be some education um, that goes along with you know any kind of bullying infraction that happens, and if it continues, you know certainly to, to see about getting you know, law enforcement involved. To, to reach out to the district attorney's office and say, listen, we have some students that we're really concerned about who are making poor choices and are taking away from the educational experience of other kids. Um, and, and that's something that, that really disappoints me. And again, I, I know that it's commonplace. I know that it happened when I was in school. I would just hope you know, that, that as we all grow up, um, that we start to make good choices, that we try to, to teach our kids to be good people. Um, and if the school called and said my student was bullying someone else, um, my son or daughter would have a lot of answering to do when they when they got home that day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Edward. Uh, bullying isn't really new. Uh, it's been going on for years. Uh, as a recreation director, we had several services through the county. Uh, and what we did is uh, married up some of these um, uh, committees and stuff to come to uh, our park and talk to our children and uh, basically uh, teach them how to act and react with each other. And uh, one of the biggest ones uh, that we had was the drug, uh, drug and alcohol abuse program. And uh, I think if we uh, work together as a community, as a school district, and as a uh, uh, recreation department, uh, I think we should all put our thoughts together and make it work. Uh, because back then it was a lot of drug and alcohol abuse problems and uh, these uh, programs worked extremely well at the park with our children and I think there's uh, still services at the county level that uh, we should look into and uh, see if they, we can marry up with them to have them come and uh, uh, talk to our administration, the board, or whatever to see what we can come up with uh, for some solutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I thought you had that in your hand. Yes. <laughs> uh, just real quick, one thing I, I neglected to mention, I just thought of, we instituted a program called Open Circles, which we use in the elementary schools with our faculty get together with their students beginning of this day or whatever, sit down and talk about uh, just stuff in general. Are, are you all right today? Is there any issues? And I think that'll pay uh, great dividends. It opens children up, feeling, and uh, feeling safe to talk to that trusted adult. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Christopher has thanks. a red yeah. card. Uh, thanks, I just wanted to use this question, take this opportunity to just, um, so we, we've we all been adolescents. We, like our parents have lectured us, we get lectured from school. Uh, as adolescents, 
we challenge those things all the time. So, as if a kids, if you could sit, a, you could you could sit a kid down and say, "Don't don't be mean, don't do this, don't do that," but it's not until they do it that they're going to learn not to do it. Right? They have they have to experience those 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 are what I call life lessons. They're best taught by life, and you can't you can't teach a child some of these life lessons. They, it has to be experienced in order for them to learn, and that's kind of how I. That's why I see the fallacy in some of this social emotional learning, is that we're trying to tell them how to act when they have to learn how to act. That's part of school. That's part of putting kids together. That, that's part of growing up and learning. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. The next question, William, you're up first for this one. Civil service employee association members make up 50% of the district staff. How will you address their concerns? Well, we as a board, we participate in negotiations every five years and do our best we can to address those concerns. The other thing we as a board rely upon is our administration to work with not only CSEA but our faculty association on a regular basis discuss concerns and whatnot. And if there's issues that need to come to the board, they bring them to the board. I'd say the biggest part of it is, is when we get to having negotiations. Okay, thank you. Nicholas? Yeah, as you said, South Hunts Falls has a, a tremendous amount of, of faculty and staff um, here on campus. I think it's important to have open lines of communication I don't think that, that the best things that are, are for our students or are for our school district happen. You know, if, if we try to, to put a barrier between us, um, and certainly, you know, our support staff, our faculty and staff, I, I would like to honestly see, um, you know, representatives from the, the both, um, you know, associations, you know, having the opportunity to, to meet with leaders from the Board of Education directly. Um, like to try to take you know that middle man out. I want people to feel comfortable in, in voicing their concerns. I don't want things to, to, to kind of be pushed aside um, because I think that that's the, the quickest way for, for positive change to happen. Um, making sure that, that they have access you know, to, to any member of the board if they so choose. Um, certainly that is by no means um, to, to create any you know, issues with, with administration. Um, but I think that, that a lot of times people are afraid to say things because they feel like there are going to be repercussions um, for them bringing up uh, issues or, or bringing up topics that sometimes are just uncomfortable. I hope that doesn't happen here in Southlands Falls, but I would certainly like to, to see a, a much um, more open line of communication between the board and between employees. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher? Could you, could you repeat that? Sure. sure. Civil Service Employee Association members make up 50% of the district staff. How will you address their concerns? Yeah, I've, I've talked to a few of them. Uh, they're, they're concerned about uh, their pay, which I, I had no idea what they're getting paid. They could go work at McDonald's and make more. Um, it's, it, it's kind of sad. I, you know, I understand there's some uh, issues there, but um, they, they're not they don't feel like they're needed here, and I think they've even been told they're not needed here, straight to their face. And so um, that is obviously not gonna keep people here. It's not gonna keep good people here. Um, so I think treating people with, with respect and you know having, uh, again, giving them authority to do their job. Uh, you know, when, when there's aides in the hallway and they're, they're not able to enforce policy, they, what do they want? What do they want them to do? And then they don't feel like they're needed. The administration may not think they're needed because they're really not doing anything. Uh, so it's just kind of a snowball effect. Thank you, Edward. Uh, being part of that group, <clears throat> being a building service supervisor, uh, and also um, a lead uh, building service supervisor for the school district, uh, dealing with um, all these employees. Um, they are um, a little disgruntled 
uh, it seems like that uh, right now we're having a hard time uh, keeping people on board uh, to uh, do these jobs. Uh, one of the things that they brought up uh, to me before, because I have to be uh, the vice president of the CSEA, uh, is the fact that uh, um, at the end of the year we have a retired superintendent come in and speak to us and uh, <clears throat> he does one heck of a <clears throat> talk and he also says that uh, <clears throat> without the support staff of everybody that's there from the aides to the uh, custodians to the cleaners to the <clears throat> bus drivers to whatever um, that the school can't operate so um, they basically uh, think that people don't look up to them as um, somebody that's needed in the school district um, I think that there's um, I think there's uh, several different things that we can look at uh, to make things happen uh, which I bring up to the board from the standpoint of um, <clears throat> looking at uh, how we can handle the uh, um, payroll uh, how we can handle the insurance uh, so that we can make things work for you have going to use your red card yeah, right? please. Continue. Um, <clears throat> uh, to make it work so that uh, we keep these people happy because uh, right now um, like Kevin had met, uh, mentioned earlier with the budget that uh, uh, we don't have enough help um, in, in dealing with these different situations of money and, and uh, how their feelings are and basically uh, training them uh, for their position uh, to make sure that uh, everything's going right. Uh, I think it'll help considerably, uh, but there would be something that I uh, discuss with the board and the administration to make things work. <coughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Hallie. Well, these are the, the people uh, on the front line and, the, and their voices do matter. And I think that, um, like Nick had mentioned, we just really need to keep lines of communication open and try to cut out the middleman and, um, and, and just do our best to address their concerns. I think the more people speak up, the more um, people on the board or elsewhere will realize that there is an issue and, and can do something about it. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Nicholas. He's going to use his red card. I'm all out of red cards, everybody, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I think, you know, certainly some of the people on the stage, it's not a stage, but brought up some really good points. I think a lot of the, the people who are maybe if they were looking you know, at, at aides, assistants, custodians, um, I think school districts sometimes really drop the ball when it comes to training those people. You know, you have somebody who comes in, um, you know, having passed a civil service test, and, and that's great, and I'm pleased that you don't mean anything you know, by that, but to put a, a, a teaching assistant in a, in a 6 one one classroom with students who have oppositional defiant disorder, um, people who, who have autism, um, and certainly there's different levels of that, or, or some other behaviors and expecting them to be successful doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, so really committing to training, you know, potentially over the summer for, for those people who are interested, I, I certainly wouldn't mandate that anybody do it, but make sure that those people feel comfortable, you know, before they go into some of those classrooms um, and, and have the skills that they need, not only for themselves to feel successful, but I think to actually help our students be successful as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next question. Nicholas, you're first. <laughs> you want to take some water or anything? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <coughs> Within the district. 
terrific question. I, I think that students have a lot of different needs. Um, you know, certainly there, there's no one size fits all classroom for, for any student. You know, as much as we can have students included in, in regular classes, I, I think we should certainly uh, make sure that we're doing that. Uh, but also having a, a commitment to, to having programs in district, uh, potentially you know partnering with, with some other districts who, who may have similar students, so that we we don't have a classroom of, of one st student who has certain needs, but maybe we are, we're partnering with with Glens Falls or somebody else, and um, you know maybe they have two students that they they can share with us, so that you know we feel like we do have a a, a good classroom. We certainly don't want one student in a classroom by himself. Uh, doesn't give a lot of social interaction. Um, so, so really kind of thinking outside the box, trying to keep as, as many of our students, I think, in district as possible, but trying to find some, some creative solutions to make sure that, that that's able to happen. Um, and, and obviously just providing opportunities for, for students with, with special needs to, to be successful as well. Um, whatever that looks like, maybe it's being able to get out of the community more often. Um, but just you know, meeting their goals, meeting their, whatever they're uh, searching for the word, um, you know, whatever their, their abilities are, making sure that they, they have the, the chance to, to maximize those. Thank you. Christopher? Yeah, um, I, I have no idea how to make it better. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what other people have, have in mind, but I guess my, my concern would be, um, and from what I what I have under, what I've gathered there's uh, in the school district there's 18 percent of the population is uh, special education. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that seems like a significant number to me. And with all these programs that have been in place now for years, um, I guess I'm curious as to if we're asking the questions, is it making a difference? Is it actually working? Uh, is that number trending up? Is it, are we trending down? Uh, I don't want to continue to do something if it's not working. Uh, so we, you know, if we got to rethink this, let's rethink it. Uh, if it is working, you know, let's let's figure out the, the different parts of what's working and exploit those. But uh, I just I don't like that number. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard it's 18 percent, which is uh, a huge portion of the population. And uh, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Edward? Um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that uh, all the students uh, with the special needs are taken care of in their, their own special way uh, so that they can uh, uh, go out into the real world uh, with the knowledge they have and the experience they would have uh, with their conditions. And I think it's something that we should look at as a board and as a district uh, to see what we can do better uh, for these uh, children. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Kelly. There is there's always more that we can do for uh, special education. Um, but I think that one of the, the, the best things we can do is, is support our special education teachers um, and listen to their concerns and try to provide them with the tools they need um, and the support that they need. Um, I think also by investing in, in early childhood education, we might be able to alleviate some of these students that are in special education later on. Um, that's why I'm really excited about the All Day UPK program, um, which hopefully will make a difference for this district. Thank you. Thank you. And William. The, um, the population of students with special needs. But one of the things we undertook this past year is we've had an outside agency come in, review our program, make recommendations, to make improvements. Um, it, it's it's a difficult population working with IEPs and 501 programs, trying to keep up with that. I think we do a remarkable job. We as a board get these um, reports at every board meeting in terms of special ed. We don't know what the patient is students are right now. But I've always found it very interesting in terms of all the cases we take, we have and the issues so many children have. And some of the comments the parents made is, is, is interesting. 
but from a district, I'm going to repeat myself. We've done a review. We're making improvements. We're making changes, and I think we're working very hard meeting these children's needs. We also send children to BOCES for programs, and we have partnered with Glens Falls and other schools uh, to share programs. Thank you. Okay, next question is going to be the last question before we go to the rapid fire. And let's see, Christopher, you're going to be first up on this one. How will you improve communication and discussion with staff, students, and the community? And how will you make yourself accessible? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, it's one thing I wanted, wanted to talk about. Uh, the, the board meetings, I, I know it's pretty standard across the board, but I just, I don't see them as effective at all. Um, it's a one-way conversation. It's really dull. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no, there's no actual communication going on in the board meetings. I know they're public. I know there's a lot of things to get through. I understand the complexities there, um, but I would like to see more uh, programs or efforts that that invite parents and children and teachers to come in and talk amongst each other. Uh, there's they're kind of segmented right now. Teachers have their thing going on. Board of Ed is public, um, you know, students, who knows what they talk about uh, amongst each other. Parents are kind of, you know, be friends with somebody, you can, you can talk, but I don't see anything that, that's happening that's bringing all those those three or four populations together to discuss these things. So I'd like to uh, um, try to help with the boards uh, create something like that. Um, I plan on having um, my own personal opinion page um, about the things that are going on within the school district um, and you know just kind of let let people know what's going on from my perspective uh, I understand the you know the complexities there as well and, and I'm, I'm fully uh, prepared to thanks thank you Edward uh, as a board member, um, we we are being elected by the, uh, the people, the parents, the community uh, to represent them, and uh, I think that uh, uh, with and I think we have it with the with our school district uh, email, uh, they should feel free to be able to uh, uh, send us an email, ask us questions, so that uh, we can deal with the situation that they have or or whatever. Um, try not to uh, really bombard us with things, but. Uh, uh, bring it to you to our attention uh, what their thoughts and feelings are and, and be able to communicate back to them thank you thank you <coughs> can you repeat the question sure how will you improve communication and discussion with staff students and the community and how will you make yourself accessible thank you. Um, sure. I am not entirely familiar with how uh, the board meetings go. Um, I think that, you know, it, I think that having an open forum uh, uh, available for anyone to come and speak their mind is great, but I think that, as Chris alluded to, maybe we should have some sort of program that gets, gets staff and um, parents involved uh, more and, and have some more communication with the board. Um, as far as personally accessible, I um, I would be open to talking with anyone. I think that's a really important part of this position. Um, I'm here to, to serve the community and that is what I would like to do. So, thanks. Thank you. William. Communication is an interesting topic. It seems like the more we do, the less it works. We have uh, engaged Capital Region BOCES to help us with our communication efforts. Uh, we've used tools like Thought Exchange, etc. The typical protocol that we've used is if one has questions, then you talk to your teacher, you talk to your principal, you talk to the superintendent. We as a board have to remember we act as a board and we don't act individually. I would be to entertain anybody's questions and be more than happy to. 
but I may not be having all the answers. You have to understand that we need to do it collectively as a board, and we need to work with the people that the board hired to run our district. Thank you. Thank you. And Nicholas. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sure, so try to sure. It's everyone. a long one. How will you improve communication and discussion with staff, students, and the community, and how will you make yourself accessible? Okay. Uh, I know previously I did mention that, that I, I certainly would like members of the board to have a more direct contact with, with members of our support staff, members of our, our faculty, um, but also with the students as well. So potentially maybe certain board members um, could take on a certain group. Um, I, I wouldn't, I, I would see those those meetings um, more from a, a, a listening perspective. You know, I, I don't want to give, you know, anyone, you know, false hope about what we might be able to accomplish, but I think it's important, again, to have that, that direct contact so people feel comfortable. Um, certainly, you know, we're in an age of, of technology, so things like email, um, I, I plan on, on having a, a Board of Education uh, Facebook page uh, moving forward in the next few days that I would invite um, you know, parents to reach out to me individually if they'd like to, to voice concerns um, as well. So I, I think that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're going to try a little experiment here. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't sorry. see that. Thank you. Um, opening up the communication with uh, with everybody um, with uh, I guess I better um, explain myself a little bit better uh, with um, getting somebody to send us an email um, not answer them directly but bring it back to the board so that we can talk actually with the board to uh, say how we're going to handle this situation it could be a situation that uh, it's more than one person or whatever and I think that we maybe we can come up with a a policy or procedure or whatever their concerns are uh, to make it work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, we have uh, five questions that can just be answered by saying yes or no. They are not open-ended questions. And I think it might be good to just turn your mics on so you don't, so you're all ready for this. And um, why don't we just go down the line instead of switching back and forth? Is that okay just to make it easier and less complicated? All righty, here we go. Oh, well, I guess we learned something, didn't we, Hallie? All right. Okay. All right, are we ready? Do you feel the district should make student mental health more of a priority? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> You're doing so much now. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you think that candidates should receive funding from an outside organization to run for the school board? No. 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 Okay. Would you support language instruction programs in elementary schools? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yes. Should homeschooled students be allowed to participate in sports and other school activities? Yes. 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 Okay. And the last one is, do you support the student transgender policies the district has adopted? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now it's time for the closing statements. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, so you each have one minute for closing, and we're going to go in the same order that we went in for the opening statement, so William, you're up first. Thank you. First, uh, thank you ladies from League of Women Voters for being here and conducting this tonight. It's more intense than I thought. Uh, I just want to uh, thank everyone that's voted for me in the past uh, in the community. 
I hope that you felt that I've done a decent job representing you as a community, and more importantly, helping and re representing our students. And I just hope that uh, I could be getting your support again this year and get re-elected uh, to the Board of Education. Again, thank you for your support. You're welcome. Thank you. Nicholas? Uh, I, I didn't mention some of my background. Um, I, I did certainly put that in my biography information that the school district has, but very quickly, um, I have been in education for nearly 20 years, um, working as a school counselor um, at the high school and the elementary levels locally. Um, and I know, you know some people may have seen my platform, um, but it's academic excellence, creating programs for at-risk students, creating courses that prepare, prepare all students for their future, supporting our special education students. Uh, I, I don't think that it's so much about a number, but what's doing right for kids, uh, and making sure that, that we're focusing on them. Acceptance, uh, having a climate where all students feel that they're welcome. Safety, making sure that we, we have plans in place that we all feel comfortable about. We'll take care of our kids and having cost-effective solutions to make sure that our buildings and classrooms are safer focusing on community collaboration, uh, continuing with the community. Thank you. <laughs> Christopher. Thanks. Um, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of a big picture kind of guy. I, you know, I see trends that I don't like. Uh, and when I see trends I don't like, I, you know, I, I try to find the root cause, figure out why those trends are happening, and, and, and do something about it. Um, I, uh, again, I want to support teachers. I want to support students and parents. I want uh, I want the school board and the district as a whole uh, to be transparent as possible, and I want to be the catalyst either to make that happen or the uh, um, or the liaison, the person, that, if you will, that that those those folks can trust to come to to make sure that their voice is heard and that the board has uh, has time to process it and, and goes through the. The necessary steps to properly process it. So I hope to be that voice for you. Thank you, Edward. Uh, I'd like to again thank uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Hopefully, I demonstrated uh, through my responses that I am here to serve the best interests of our students, to foster an environment uh, that uh, empowers our staff, and do both in a uh, manner in which our community can. Uh, financially uh, support. Uh, I love the community, I love the school district, and I'm here to um, give back. Uh, also, um, in uh, <clears throat> my uh, resume, so to speak, um, I have uh, 15 years experience um, uh, in this, uh, as building service supervisor in the school. I coached here for 15 years, uh, JV and varsity basketball, baseball, or excuse me, JV uh, baseball and JV basketball, modified football uh, plus modified baseball. Um, and my degree is in uh, marketing and business administration and I'm a graduate of Albany Business College. Uh, so I appreciate uh, your support and I thank everybody here for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And Haley. Uh, thank you for all the questions. I think that this Board of Education election is a critical one. Um, it is important that our board is a representation of the community, and currently there is only one woman confirmed to be serving on the board next year. This board needs more women's voices, more mothers' voices, and I can be that voice. If I am elected as a member of the board, I will base my decisions on facts and input from the community, including parents, teachers, and administrators. I will encourage proposals of new initiatives to improve the education of our children, and I will consider the safety of every single child in our schools. Uh, I believe that if we can come together as a community, and listen to one another, and respect each other, we can better our schools while supporting every one of our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I want to thank all the candidates for being here this evening and helping to educate your voters. And I want to thank the audience for attending and learning more about the candidates. I also want to recognize the fact that everyone followed the guidelines that we asked for, and I, we definitely appreciate that. And so, give yourself.